appreciate that. Thank you. Now we've got City Holdings Thank you, here. Sharon. Thanks, Gil. Cheers. We've got City Holdings here, so we're going to get them in now because they were scheduled for 11. <laughs> so Mel and I are going to swap. We're going to do them, and then we'll come back and do the wrap-up of... Um, are you going to go to PX after to do their strategy? Yeah. Yep. 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 Welcome to the table. I feel like we see you every month. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Um, go ahead. Did you want to speak to your report? Yeah, just firstly, um, an apology from Abby. So she had planned to be here, but um, yeah. had, was not able to, to move her her timetable to accommodate the, the latest start. Um, so apologies from that front. Um, and Tony's got some uh, introductory comments to make on the report. Great. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to provide a brief overview of the financial performance um, group for the nine months to March. Uh, all subsidiaries um, continue to face ongoing pressures uh, resulting from the macroeconomic environment and resourcing constraints. But despite these ongoing pressures, all subsidiaries have met or exceeded their budgets um, and we expect uh, this trend to play out um, for the full year. Uh, this has translated into a dividend to Council of $34.2 million, um, which we paid this Friday, uh, in line with our SOI target. Uh, in terms of um, performance for subsidiaries, uh, the, in particular the airport, city care, Enable and LPC um, outperformed against their budgets. Um, the airport's profit is 32% ahead of budget, noting the strong performance in freight and property. Um, but also noting that they're sitting on 81% of pre-pandemic passenger numbers. Um, CityCare's result is ahead of budget and is largely driven by Spencer Henshaw, uh, which was acquired after the 2023 SOI was set. Um, enables tracking ahead of budget, mainly as a result of higher recurring revenue um, due to less customer churn than, than expected and strong cost control particularly around personnel and um, indirect costs. Um, LPC continues to benefit from the ongoing impact of recent contract negotiations, although container volumes are lower than budget due to loss of space um, due to construction of a new crane, um, along with labour shortages. Um, but there's high confidence that volumes will increase once um, operations return to normal. Um, that's what we have, a high-level presentation, so that concludes that. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, Ayani. Thanks. Are you able just to give us an understanding of the trend around the reporting into the highest paid and the lowest paid? Sorry, it's one of the um, actions. I'll just, I can try and find what page. Um, so it's just on page 263 um, and uh, it's towards the top. CCHL will encourage its subsidiaries to report on and work to show a narrowing of the gap between the highest and lowest remuneration in each company. And it says it's ongoing, actively monitored by all subs, and reporting has commenced from FY 2022. Are, are you able just to give us a high level sense of what the reporting is showing? Uh, so the, the trend analysis will be taken once we have an, an, another annual result. So they don't report to us quarterly on that, they report annually in their annual reports. For the financial year to finish, the annual props to be produced, and then we, then we get a sense of what the gap is. Yeah, that's what we do at this point. Yeah. So yes. when, when is that likely to happen? Is that first of uh, August or September or? Uh, usually or? end of September. Um, however, Orion will be publishing the annual report shortly, because they've got a 31 March balance date. So th this is a, an area of focus for us. In fact, we had a session earlier this morning on this, this very. 
So you will notice that in the past the reporting has just been um, by salary bands and now that includes the average of the lowest 10% and average of the highest 10% salary earners so that we've had one year's worth of data, which is why Tony was saying that it's hard, you can't extrapolate a trend from one year's worth of data. Right, okay, but we'll start to see the trend. Yeah, okay. Great, thank you. Um, Tyrone? Thanks, um, Mel. <coughs> Excuse me. So just w with regard to the um, to the Littleton Port Company, so, I mean, how, how important is um, the contribution of cruise ships to the to the um, to the financial performance of, of the LPC um, um, just in your estimation um, I can't give you an exact percentage but I can come back to you on that I mean the reality is it has been a, a significant contribution so I think of the you know they budgeted for 60 odd uh, ships in the first year and, and the numbers being exceeded and and future growth is anticipated so from that point of view um, they're reporting to us all notes that that the um, that the revenue from the cruise ships arriving has been a, a an important contributor to the improved um, revenue performance and profitability. Because my, my my basic reading of the of the table here on page, uh, geez, uh, page two hundred and sixty nine of our of our agenda, yeah. <laughs> um, it says that that like it has revenue um, under under target but operating margin above target and. My, my simple brain says, oh, that's because we've got low, low overhead um, ships turning up in Littleton that, that just turn up, park, and people jump off and on rather than require straddles and cranes and all that sort of stuff. Is that a, would, would that be a, a, an accurate reading of that or is that just crazy stuff? I think um, in relation to revenue, um, it's... Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, it's more about the volumes going down. As I talked to you before, the um, the volumes are lower than budget, so I think it's more around that. I think we can come ask the team to come back specifically on the cruise thing. Yep. I yeah, yeah, that's that. cool. Like, can, can I? Yeah, yeah, can I? Yeah. So through through you, Leah, or yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah, cool. No, there, there has been a question. Sorry, I wasn't trying to. I was just what the, yeah. <laughs> what the revenue specific revenue line is for the cruise ships, and whether it's by ship and by passenger numbers. Okay. And yeah. whether there's any differentiation depending on the type of cruise vessel that comes to Littleton as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying, keen to get some facts around that, but thank you, thank you. Yep. Awesome, thank cheers. You. We'll get back to you. Probably good timing, uh, after because this was the first official, really, uh, cruise season, so it might be quite yep. good to see the results after that this year. Yep. yep. Kelly? Um, thanks, guys. <clears throat> uh, this is kind of like a, a, a broad kind of question. Um, as an entity, um, do you look to... Uh, growing the portfolio of um, of, of assets that, that we have uh, in CCHL? So CCHL uh, has and continues to consider opportunities that are put in front of us uh, and we have a process in terms of taking those through to the board for approval um, and there have been a number of opportunities explored in, in recent years, um, none of which have got to the point of being executed from a uh, from a new investment perspective, you know, certainly in terms of uh, investments of scale, um, but um, uh, um, what can I say? Part of that, a big part of that, has been uh, the fact that in order to execute those investments, there are other assumptions you have to rely on, and, and you know, cost escalation and other things have impacted other projects, and and those those sorts of pressures do tend to impact our final decisions as well. So, um, <clears throat> how much of a priority is it? to CCHL to, to look for new opportunities. And I'm bit interested in, um, you know, over over time, wh what are recent acquisitions, you know, like maybe in the last five or ten years? So, sorry, as a new councillor, I, I don't know when all these things kind of the new active came, CE. came on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the history as well before my time, my oh, time, the, yeah, my time as yeah. well. So um, uh, in terms of, again, you know, are we open for business from that point of view? Then yes, we are. And if you look at our purpose statement, it is to have a positive impact on uh, not just the commercial returns of the, the existing portfolio, um, but uh, other opportunities that would uh, benefit the, the growth of the city and region as well. So that shows up in our person, purpose and mission statements. Um, from a prioritisation point of view, obviously you're looking at the demands 
the capital demands of the existing portfolio. First and foremost, and as we've talked about in other sessions, there are uh, challenges and opportunities attached to that as we look forward, which helps inform our risk appetite to consider new investments. And right now, our strategic priority is to get through the strategic review work program mm. that you've asked us to complete. And coming out the other side of that, we would be addressing the question of what other opportunities exist that we might not um, be considering in our current portfolio, which we might want to consider in the future. <clears throat> uh, just one last question. After that process is um, completed, um, you know, how much more of a priority is it going to be to, to look at uh, other opportunities, do you think? I mean, will, we, will you be resourced enough to do that, do you think? Um, uh, does it depend on two, the direction we take? Yeah, sorry, two answers to that question. So firstly, um, is the opportunity to look at other investments will be determined by what your requirements are. So yeah. our business case is going to be responding to your okay. long-term requirements for our portfolio in terms of what you want to see from it in respect of income, in terms of capital growth, and in terms of impact across the non-financial capital. So we will be reviewing the portfolio to, 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 to look at the extent to which it delivers on those requirements once you've made those um, clear to us. In terms of the operational capacity of CCHL to proactively seek new investments, um, we run on the smell of an oily rag. So mm. um, in fact, I don't think you can smell the oily rag. Um, <laughs> so um, the capacity is not there to, to proactively seek external mm. investments at this particular point in time. The future operating model would need to consider that. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, because it seems to me that there are <clears throat> opportunities you know, out there all the time, and, and yeah. So I would say one of the one of the operational requirements that that um, that you asked of us uh, at the end of last year was to strengthen our connections with other entities like Christchurch NZ as the Economic Development Agency um, and uh, and Naitahu and other uh, other key stakeholders. So we are investing time in that. That is starting to create the relationships. I wouldn't say it's a pipeline, but the relationships which you know which could give way. To a pipeline, we just need to make sure that that in in being a uh, a filter for those opportunities, that they still deliver on the investment objectives we're expected sure. to meet. We're not in the business of providing economic incentives. Not our role at, at CCHL. Mm. And can, can, can I just ask one, one final question? In terms of uh, diversification of uh, the assets. You know that we have. I've heard talk in the past that that we're quite vulnerable as a city because a lot of our assets are here. Yeah. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah. So, so the the nature of the portfolio is diversified across the infrastructure sector. So, if you look at certainly across Australasia, there's no other city that has a portfolio that's this diversified. If, if Auckland and Tauranga and uh, Napier are all single asset, largely single asset plays, um, with a bit of other investment that, that helps deliver some additional return to them. So from a from an infrastructure portfolio, this is probably the most diversified portfolio in New Zealand. Oh, wow. um, but the concentration risk is firmly Christchurch and Canterbury. And again, that comes back to the purpose and mission statement, which has been to support the growth of mm. Christchurch and, and Canterbury. Mm. Right. And that's, Thanks, that's one of the factors we'll, we'll consider in the strategic review. Yeah, thank you. Pauline? Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and just going to page um, 275 um, on the um, Red Bus um, Ferry Road site. Yep. So is there nothing we can be doing in the meantime? I see that's been parked until the strategic review, but surely we should be following that to the statement of intent if we're working together with um, you and, 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 and council to... Determine options for that? Yeah, yeah. so um, we have previously reported on this. So there has been a prior program of work which considered the, the possible future use of, of that site uh, and it looked at a range of opportunities. Um, uh, and that, that engagement has uh, included engagement with Christchurch NZ. So we asked the urban development team at Christchurch NZ to, to do a revised master plan for us, looking at opportunities to intensify that land holding and including the potential for residential to form part of that. Um, we've also been engaged with other parties, um, including um, ECAN and others that have expressed interest in, uh, in, in uh, using or accessing that land, uh, as well as some social 
enterprises that have asked the same. So, so you just mean you're parking a decision on that until after the strategic review? Yeah, so, so until, until we get through the strategic review, and again, you know, this will be responding to your requirements and you tell us what you need <coughs> in terms of the, the nature and quantum of the returns from CCHL's portfolio, we'll be able to make a final decision then. Okay, uh, until that, that time. That's clear. So it the work has been done on the options. It has been done. Right, thank you. And, and we have engaged with Bruce and, and others in the property team on that. Yeah. And just um, back to um, 269, just on the port, the carbon reduction, and just looking at the um, the straddles unable to use the biodiesel, which isn't attractive anymore now the subsidies come off anyway, but are they looking at hydrogen or any other? They are, um, they are looking at, certainly looking at other opportunities because uh, it's the thing that moves the dial. Yeah. For them, um, the technology and equipment and affordability um, pace circle has not been resolved yet. So, so would they have to replace them with hydrogen friendly? Straddles? Yes. So there, so there will be, it is anticipated there will be um, a point in time when the alternative technologies uh, are available, which which they would uh, they'd be looking to replace. But you know these straddles do have a long life, so you'd have. You'd have a, a stranded investment, if you like. So, so then the question becomes, what do you do with the existing straddles before you replace them? So it's not just a question of the existing right. the affordability of the new technologies, but what you do with your existing stock and as can't, well. And can, can't convert them? I'm not a straddle expert from a conversion point of view, no. Oh, okay, it's quite sad, because I think they're quite, they're quite um, high emitters, aren't they? <coughs> No. It's yeah, it's the thing that moves the dial for them. So they're obviously conscious of it. I mean, if, if there was a direction to do it, they could execute, but it would be a significant investment and we would have quite a large sunk cost attached to the existing infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. You, you can... Uh, there was a proposal put to um, LBC a number of years ago about converting the straddle cranes to 50-50 hydrogen, 50 and they didn't take it up because they were leaning on the biodiesel side of it. But anyway, that's that. But there's, there is an opportunity to do it going forward, so I'll, I'll be in touch. Yeah. Just a question is, um, on, on the city care one, it's got just about written in every line, target excludes Spencer Henshaw. In the next one of these, it will be all... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so we have a requirement uh, on city care that they do a one-year post-investment review, uh, which is due in September. Um, and then from that moment on... Um, Obviously, well, into the next financial year, the Spencer Henshaw results will be consolidated into there. Okay, no, thanks. So the next one we will see or have it in properly. Absolutely. Good on you. It's Thank because you. that was set in June last year and they acquired Spencer Henshaw in September. So. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Phil's kind of semi-answered around the straddle cranes, but isn't that one of the dangers in us transitioning when you have something like a subsidy on a biofuel so people use that rather than the uh, the hydrogen has that switch has a five year payback, which on anyone's books is a great investment. But when you're up against something that's being subsidised, suddenly it doesn't look good. So sometimes when we think we're doing something that's good and green, uh, like a biofuel subsidy, yep. has unintended consequences that a it never stacked up, and now transitioning to other things is. So I mean, how do you guys look at that and weigh that up? Um, or is it just purely political so you can't? Uh, well, I mean, the, the decision to offer incentives is a political decision. Mm -hmm. It's something that we respond to from a commercial perspective. And obviously, if someone's trying to incentivise a certain behaviour and it works for you from a, uh, an economic point of view, a financial point of view, and a deliverability point of view, so it improves the efficiency as well, then that's a sensible decision path to follow. Uh, it doesn't preclude you looking at other opportunities. So, I mean, obviously, you, know, you, you can see that, that uh, incentives are, by nature, time-bound. Um, otherwise, they're not incentives, they're subsidies. Um, and you should be reasonably expecting that there'll be a, a date when that plaster gets ripped off and you need to have a, a strategy in place to, to transition. And that's certainly part of LPC's considerations. Yeah, and I saw kind of Phil chomping at the bit before on it, so it'll be good to see some of those uh, options being explored more, and obviously he will have those conversations. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Great. Um, You've already asked a question, Yami, and we're going to go into PX in a moment, so um, I'm going to move. Um, have we got a seconder for this report? Oh, Aaron. Um, have we got any debate on this? 
Right, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. It's carried. So now we're moving into PX. Um, so resolution to exclude the public. Have we got a mover? Um, Sarah, second um, um, the Mayor. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. It's carried. So we'll get all the public, sorry, and any staff not involved in this one to um, exit, and then, um, then we'll move back to Take our house straight after that.